Thanks, Simon. Um, this is Linda. I have a question for you. Um, could Simon and others please explain what are the specific challenges of teaching online to learners who have specific learning issues such as dyslexia and ADHD? What techniques are there for accommodating these students? And um, so, yes, yeah, so there's it's quite a long question, but if we start perhaps with, with those particular issues. I mean, I think it's a very important question. I think one of the things that you know, the, the, the and I, I'm by no means the you know, sort of single point uh, expert in this, but one of the things I've been very encouraged by during the course of the last 12, 15 years in working in an online environment is the response I've had from students with particular uh, specific learning dif differences. And whether that's uh, dyslexia or dyspraxia or um, you know, uh, some of the concentration uh, elements, in each case, the fact that the asynchronous uh, nature of some of this activity allows students to pause, reflect, rewind, come back to something. They can take effectively a, a time out, which in a, you know, that 50 minute tutorial, 50 minute lecture uh, experience, you know, can be recorded, can be made up, but actually it's pretty difficult for students and particularly the anxiety that comes with you know, associated in some of these uh, students. Actually providing, you know, the uh, online learning community is a much more reassuring place. It does disaggregate some of the experiences of, uh, not, not always, um, but does disaggregate some of the experiences that um, people from minorities have felt also in terms of some of the structures that um, predominate in campus-based teaching. And I think those are, you know, real enablers for this um, discourse and the opportunity that we have to, you know, challenge some of those uh, power structures is a really important part of this moment, not least because, you know, the intersection with the uh, you know, current uh, Black Lives Matter um, campaign, these are all opportunities to reappraise, you know, where those you know, prejudices lie and they do lie in, you know, in higher education in the way they do across society. So. I think some of those accessibility issues, whether it's on disability or race, are really important parts of uh, this. I absolutely agree that the asynchronicity is of enormous value to certain kinds of students with special needs. Um, and on, online can, can, can work both ways, you know, it can be a huge advantage to, to people. And that's one reason. Another reason is if you, if you think of your face-to-face your -face classes and which students always engage in class discussion when you have a plenary discussion and the students who never say a word. One of the things that fascinated me about um, online discussion was the way those people who never said a word in a meeting or in a class were vociferous when it came to being able to write something asynchronously, to think about what they were saying, not having to kind of jump in and have that sort of breathtaking moment where you're actually going to have to start to speak now in front of all these people. You know, for, for very many people, Online is a, is, a, is a much pleasanter experience for them. So, so that's one thing. And then the ADHD point, I think it's, um, you know, when it comes to video lectures, for example, we're all ADHD. You only have to look at the um, quite shocking statistics of how long we watch videos for on, um, you know, FutureLearn or something like that. And if people watch for more than a minute or two, you know, you've really done well. And yet, you know, I'm still seeing 50 minute lectures, talking head videos being done um, in online learning, which is utterly pointless. Now, if you've got ADHD, being able to come in and out of a lecture, just what, watching it in, in, in short clips, something like that would be of enormous value. But we must stop just converting 50 minute lectures into, you know, online lectures of the same length. It's absurd. Thanks, Diana. And, and thank you, Simon. Um, I, I think uh, we've reached the point now where we can just open the discussion up um, so we can take uh, either back questions or new questions addressed to either of the speakers or indeed to, to each other. So Gwyneth, has anything um, um, caught your attention? Well, there's, there's a couple of questions that for, for, for Simon, but I think they'll be relevant to Diana as well about the sort of fatigue with having lots of socialisation activities um, um, and sort of icebreakers and whether there are other kinds of activities you can do to um, get students to socialise together. 
Oh, it's a fair, it's a fair point. I, I, I saw that one in the in the chat and just pushed back a little uh, bit on it. I, I think there is a value to doing that to a degree over uh, and again, partly because it's familiar to students. And I think some of the um, importance of familiarity is really one of the things uh, that you know an online learning community does provide. I think also, you know, I wouldn't dwell on it. The, you know, the, the exercise or the, the, demo, the, the first utility, as it were, I shared is, you know, one formative uh, thing that we might do at the beginning of a, a study session. There are, you know, any number of different exercises you could do after that, and I'd be happy to share them, you know, in, in greater depth. But I think it's just to, to get the ball rolling and to provide an opportunity for students, you know, the different configuration of classes, you know, students may be on the same module that they were last time, but, you know, it's possible that they, they're not, um, more likely, frankly. And I think that you have, have the opportunity to just reappraise and reflect in that environment. And by doing different tasks through the course or, or you know, the different focus of that, it's not just about, hello, my name's Simon, I'm from wherever. It's actually posing a question that, hello, my name's Simon, the last book I read was, next time the last film I saw, you know, the best recipe I've had during lockdown, you know, the best bit of music that's inspired me. All of these are different, just little tweaks that mean you're not doing the same thing over and over again and it's boring. It's actually, but I'm just building out my portfolio. I'm providing another connection, another network, you know, so the colleague who I was previously in a class with, who, who I understood, you know, the best restaurant in Madrid was, now I find out they also like, you know, a particular piece of music or, you know, what have you. And I think those little nuances just allow you to, you know, notch the dial around and prevent sort of boredom. But because it's a familiar process, students are enabled to know what they're doing. You don't have to explain that bit, you know, excuse me, um, I'm not quite sure what I should be doing here. That's just, you know, well laid out, well thought out. Um, uh, approach to this means you don't need to go through that process. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I, if I could leap in, I noticed that there are quite a lot of likes for the question put by Mary about could we have another example of mm. a, an mm. online community activity? I, I'd happily have um, what I answered. I would, you know, set a task, for example, read this piece of text, you know, on the subject matter, you know, whatever it may be, you know, biology, history, English, you know, provide a 250 word appraisal of it into a forum discussion, discuss that, you know, with a peer group that, you know, reflects the nature of the, the course. Predominantly nothing more than 15 students. Beyond that, you tend to break out. So actually keeping it relatively small, but then you have to respond. Those two, that 250 word appraisal of a document, be it a journal article or a newspaper piece or you know, a film or a piece of audio, that 250 words you've published, you need to respond to other colleagues, your peers. If everyone in the group does that, you've immediately created a database, as it were, effectively, of different opinions about that article. Now, they may or may not be, as it were, right, but they're certainly as valid as each other. By commenting on others, you are learning in yourself, as Diana said. We've actually got a situation where well, I looked at what you said and I hadn't picked that up. That's really interesting. Or I looked at what you know someone else said and thought, I just do not see that in that piece. I can't read that text in that way. It doesn't, I, I don't know how you've arrived at that conclusion. Now, you've thought about what you're thinking in those terms. You've thought about your reading of the text and providing the you know assessment point further down the line that is actually, I reviewed my 250 words I found that I, you know, I was informed by my colleagues here and my colleagues there. And actually my submission of those 250 words has been enhanced this way. It's a good way of enhancing your critical reflection. Well, there's another one I'd like to, to add. Um, I mean, I've, I've never enjoyed icebreaker activities personally, and I never run them, I think, because I find them a bit irritating. But I think some of Simon's examples have been much better because you can focus them on the, you know, the, the content of what you're you're doing as well. But um, very often, if I'm worried about um, enabling people to easily answer a question after a, a lecture or talk or something, is to create a buzz group first, so that, that people have the opportunity to discuss with each other, just for five minutes, um, what their question might be or what there was that they're not too sure about or something like that. Because then what they discover is, first of all, how to articulate that point in that 
quick little conversation, and also that somebody else is interested in that point as well. And so you're much more likely to get much better questions when you go to questions from the whole group. And so it's a little like a kind of online learning community and where you can break people up into groups. Not always terribly easy when it's synchronous, but um, anything like that you can do. So these, these Q&A sessions, for example, are, are very good because people are able to think about without having to sort of leap into a conversation and perform really good questions. I mean, these are great questions going through here. So it, it, it's kind of like the buzz group, but for the entire community, <laughs> works well. Thanks, Diana. By virtue of, of Linda, we need to wait. They're actually providing a level of analysis to this. <laughs> As Diana and I are, you know, presenting, we're not, you know, dual focused as, as well. So actually, this is sort of demonstrating some of that practice. And I think, Linda, you've got another question. Yes. Well, it was really to um, to push on from absolutely. We've we've had a lot about collaboration and co-creation of, of knowledge, and I just wondered if if either of our of our colleagues wanted to. Uh, just mention briefly how that might be tied into formative and summative assessment and, and the role of assessment in helping to create those online communities. I'll kick off on that. I think certainly creating an environment where you, know, you have assessment for learning, recognising that learning is driven to a point, particularly student eyes at undergraduate level to you know, what assessment, well, how am I going to, how am I going to, uh, what's the value of this to me? And I think you know we can help in this regard in you know, re-educating or you know, challenging some of the you know, long-held views about what assessment you know, is and how it fits in. You know, nothing um, depresses me more than uh, well, a few things, but in this instance, um, than you know having an assessment which is not sensitive to the learning um, outcome. And you know, in this regard, I think we can. You know, integrate a variety of different forms of assessment, you know, some which are much more accessible, leading to you know, interesting sort of outcomes, be they presentations or you know, uh, policy papers, things that aren't necessarily traditional to higher education, but it can be incorporated because you've built them up in a constructive fashion. And through the course of a module, being over you know, six weeks, 10 weeks, however, you know, however many uh, sessions there are, the student has a, an opportunity to think about some really innovative ways of putting their assessment together, you know, drawn from that reflective practice within a discussion forum, just drawn from their peers engagement, you know, your assessment being something that, you know, can only be achieved through that collaborative experience on certain, in certain ways. And I think those are, you know, very apt for this, for this moment, the way that we're, you know, conducting this, um, session the way that we're thinking about that you know one of the opportunities i'll have is the reflection afterwards what will i take away from this and i think some of those uh, opportunities and then capturing them in both formative and summative ways is something that students really respond to particularly if you offer the opportunity for feedback on well i, I was just um noticing a question from elizabeth at coventry was um, was asking about you know, students are intrinsic, extrinsically motivated and everything we do with assessment is extrinsic motivation in a sense for students. So how do we nudge them towards intrinsic? And I think that comes back to what I was saying earlier about the creativity that you can give to students or the opportunity to be creative and to represent what they've learned in a much wider variety of different ways when you, you embrace online tools, for example. Um, and if you enable them to, to represent their learning in, in a variety of different ways and even to um, negotiate what aspect of a topic they decide to talk about and so on, the more you give them a sense of self-efficacy and the more they feel that they can bring some initiative and, and some of the, themselves to this problem, the more they will feel that kind of intrinsic engagement with, with the topic and that's the best we can do for them, I think. So. It's, um, I mean, it's something you can do with formative assessment. It's much more difficult with summative assessment because, you know, we are teaching them to a particular curriculum and two particular kinds of learning outcomes. And 
the degree to which those can be relaxed varies a great deal from one subject to another, of course. But at least with formative assessment, we can we can allow them to be nudged towards being intrinsically motivated by the fascination of this topic for themselves. You know, get them to describe what's fascinated you about something you've read recently. Mm. I, I think that's right, and I think that yes. that also goes to uh, some way towards answering a question that was asked earlier. Um, which was students may feel they're being asked to do the teacher's job if we ask them to pre-prepare, such as creating PowerPoints before coming to class. And how do you overcome this thinking? And I, I think that goes some way to answering that one as well. Exactly. And also, there's a question here about uh, for Diana, whether you've got any feedback from students in using the, the very interesting approaches you described earlier. Um, or is it still early days for getting no, feedback? No. I mean, we'll need to, sorry, we'll need to make this the last question, just mm -hmm. looking at the time. Yeah, well, very quickly then. I mean, these were the kinds of things I used to, to do in my um, Moodle. Um, well, they weren't Moodle courses. They were, they were courses that used Moodle. And um, I would explicitly ask about those sorts of things in, in the feedback, you know, which were the exercises that, that you really enjoyed most. And as I said, I think in reply to one of those things, um, we always do those sorts of surveys um, for MOOCs on what were the things you really enjoyed. And actually doing a peer review has more than once come out number one top. Mm. Yes, I agree. Mm. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for bearing with us during the, uh, the various technology gremlins we've experienced today, which uh, just goes to show it is possible to nevertheless surmount these things and um, come out with a decent discussion at the end of things. I'd just like to turn to Linda now for any final words or reflections you'd like to make, Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to just thank the uh, our, our presenters, our chair, our two speakers and uh, Gwyneth for uh, moderating with me. And thank you very much to the audience for submitting such ex an excellent range of questions. Um, it's an interesting mode um, using this Teams format. I wouldn't necessarily say it's my favourite approach <laughs> to these events, but it is. Uh, it was an experiment today. We did have two questions that were submitted in advance of the event, and one of them was was picked up in the discussion around um, meeting additional needs, learners needs. And the second one was quite a specific one, so we haven't had a chance to address that today, but I will try and get a bit of a response back to the uh, person who submitted those in advance. So this was the second and the last of our jumping online uh, webinars, and thank you very much for joining the Centre for Distance Education. We will be having some further events in, in the uh, summer and then into the autumn, and we'll keep you posted on those. We recognise that everybody now is moving to the, to the new normal of having to teach um, uh, and struggle with Teams and Zoom etc as, as well as designing excellent online interactive learning communities. So thank you very much for joining us. We will make sure that you have the link to the recording and to the slides and I think you'll also be able to see the discussion questions as well if we extract those. So Thank you very much, everybody, and thank again, thank you again to Diana and Simon, to Stephen and Gwyneth, and to Andrew and Mark in the background for um, solving solving the knots. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Take thank care. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.